Hello, everybody. Um, this is the Scottish Rugby Podcast, brought to you by the Scottish Rugby Blog. It's our bonus little um, Only Fins podcast that we do during kind of internationals and autumn uh, nations, where we do a kind of short mini pod just after the team announcement. Um, I've got John Anderson with me. Hello, John. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, and we're also we're really lucky to be joined. With. We've got Mitch from the Rugby Fixation Podcast in Queensland joining us as well. Hello to Mitch. G'day, guys. Thanks very much for having me. No, that's okay. It's good to get a kind of an Aussie perspective. As we're, we're as we're recording this, unfortunately, the, the Australian team has not been out, and we we were just talking before we came on air that um, we, we're puzzled to to know why, given half the Aussie team have been on Scottish time previously, that they don't understand how time difference works. <laughs> I mean, they've called in so many French players. Maybe they're trying to wait for it to work for Paris. They're just going to you go to every time zone except <laughs> the one that actually benefits. You know. Yeah. Um, so we've got the Scotland team anyway, so we will chat about that and do a bit of a um, a bit of a preview. So we've got front row of Schumann, Turner, Ferguson. Second row is Sam Skinner, Grant Gill, Chris Backrow, Jimmy Ritchie, Hamish Watson, Matt Ferguson. We've got Ali Price and Finn Russell together again. Uh, we've got um, Sam Johnson, Chris Harris at centre. Then you've got Duhan van der Moe back with, uh, on one wing, Darcy on the other, and Stuart Hogg at fullback. Um Replacements, Ewan Ashman, Jamie Batty, Ollie Kebble, Jamie Hodgson, Josh Bayliss, George Horn, Adam Hastings and Kyle Stain. Uh, John, that but is it the, the bench is a little bit of a surprise in places. I think the, the team's there or thereabouts what we were expecting. Yeah, I, I think given the obvious, uh, I mean, we're quite, quite far down our, our depth chart now in terms of second rows, so... Given the injuries we've got there, that's still a very, very good second row to put out. And I think the rest of the team probably picked itself in a lot of ways. Um, the bench, yeah, there's a couple of, couple of surprises on there. I had I just, I mean, not being that guy, but I had mentioned Ashman previously. So uh, just being that guy. But uh, yeah, Ashman, it's great to see him in there. He has been playing really well this season. Uh, so obviously he's getting his reward. I think, you know, there's... Hooker's a strange one uh, for Scotland just now. I think there is a a degree of obviously Turner seems to have kind of usurped everyone, um, and Fraser Brown injured. McAnally hasn't really come back that well, so shit. It's just I think trying out some new options isn't bad. Um, it's good to see Bayless get his get his run as well. Um, we'll see where he comes on. He could be quite destructive with ball in hand as well. And as you say, Cammy said before we started. There's potential. There's potential for some cats and a rave. Yeah, because it's the dream. So this, is Mitch, we this is our dream lineup here. The, the potential for this of, of having George Horn coming on at nine, Finn Russell shifting to twelve, and Adam Hastings at ten. That's what we refer to as cats as a rave. We're all better off, and anything can happen at that point. We were well, close. It... We were close against Fiji a few years ago. We had Price. Price Hastings Russell, didn't we? No, we achieved it. We achieved the full oh, cats. Did we get the full cats? That, oh. that, Hastings, that Hastings try came off the back of cats at Rave. It was George Horn oh, so it was, yeah. to Russell, who then stuck. It was Horn, Hastings, <laughs> Russell, and Hastings did the loop around and was put through the hole. That's and magnificent. Just, yeah. So we, we've achieved it. Mitch, how, how, in terms of, like, obviously, we Australia have had a tough time of it up until recently, and then you've got this run of five games. Where mm-hmm. you've beaten, you know, you've you've beaten South Africa, and it's it's quite. It, I don't know. Before this, when it was announced, I thought, "Oh, great, Australia again. This would be this would be good." I felt, felt like we were in a good place, but now I'm not so sure. <laughs> so, how does this feel? Can I see the Scottish team? How does this feel to you as an Aussie? Um, it, it feels very mixed because I think uh, the 2021 yardstick's been moved so much. With um, obviously the three test series against France was a B slash C team, and getting pumped three times by New Zealand. The mood in Australia was very sort of all over the place until we beat South Africa twice and everyone's like, oh, we're world beaters, we're back to number one. Um, <laughs> Australians are very poor losers but great winners. So as soon as, um, <laughs> as, soon as we're winning, everyone's bandwagoning. So I, I think it, there's a lot of excitement, but people have been very quick to bring up. Um, even people that I work with that aren't massive rugby fans have said, wait, last time we played Scotland, didn't they wipe the floor with us? Wasn't that like a real pants pulled down sort of moment and look at it was i think the excitement sort of lies in those teams are so different from four years ago we haven't had a chance to play each other recently so i think hooper beal and uh tupo are probably the only three in the squad that sort of survived um from that game and you know i don't really rate beal much of a chance of starting hopefully so my, my 
my concern really is just how strong the Scotland team looks with the European, um, sorry, with the UK based players back in there. Because last week they demolished Tonga, which is a step down from the Wallabies, obviously. But the side was so damaging. Like seeing Rufus McLean and Kyle Stein just carve up, I thought this is going to be a real hassle for us. Um, and then you see that neither of them can start, stands on the bench, but they've brought in Van der Merwe and Hogg to <laughs> fill the shoes out of the back. Like it's, it's really probably the most dangerous I've seen the back line look collectively. Um, and it's best represented by all the Lions call-ups this year. So I'm, I'm sort of shaken. I don't think the five game streaks really doing us that much of a favor. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting, John, because I think we said that this, this feels like, I think we said this on the podcast this week, it, this feels very much like a team picked to play Australia because you've got the five, three split on the bench. I think we'll see a different split against South Africa next weekend. Um, but it's the, 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 the back row battle and the battle at the breakdown is going yeah. to be absolutely fascinating, yeah. especially because we've got, you know, Roman Poit, who just seems <laughs> to like to, to ref. It's his last game. This is his last international last game. game. Yeah. All, all bets just, are off. All, you know, no, no laws, just vibes. That's what it goes on. <laughs> that, was, that was the first message I sent my group chat was, if it's his last game, I don't have a clue how this could go. Like, we could be... We could be seeing absolute madness. We could see the strictest game he's ever done. Like it, anything could happen. Yeah. Um. It, but I, I think just you two mentions there the back row battle, like Hamish Watson versus Michael Hooper. This is probably two of the most informed sevens in the world. Um. Obviously, Six Nations player of the tournament. Um. Most Aussie fans, but even a lot of South Africans and Kiwis, I've seen trumpeting Hooper for World Player of the Year. There's so much like to like about this matchup. I know the sevens don't you know tend to just um see each other that often but just seeing two players are probably at the peak of their powers right now is awesome and, and the other thing i just want to throw out you and ashman I, I didn't know much about him going into this and getting a debut i thought maybe he wouldn't get that against uh south africa but i think uh, you're right like this is a game against wallabies we don't have a settled uh, hooker or backup hooker this is probably a pretty good game to you know test that you know our line out's not super damaging we've got a pretty good scrum at the moment but you know this is a pretty good game to make your debut against i think yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The, the, the hooker thing is interesting, John, because uh, the lineup wasn't brilliant against Tonga. No. no. And, and you know, so, I mean, it's not, you know, I think that, you know, Turner did a good job. And I think you've got, obviously, got Gilchrist back in and Sam Skinner does a lot of lineup like, calling and stuff. So, I don't know. That, that's going to be interesting, I think, if, if Australia, as Mitch says, hasn't, haven't got a settled hooker and Scotland's lineouts a work in progress, it seems. I, do you know what I think? Like I've obviously given Grant Gilchrist what for on this podcast so many times, right? But to be fair to him, he is a world class line out operator. So Turner Turner's darts tend to be a bit ropey. You know, we see it at Glasgow as well. He can he can be a little bit wayward, but there's other times he turns up and he you know he'll nail every throw and he'll you know he's just he's inconsistent. So if he has one of his good days with Gilchrist, kind of probably calling the line out, I would imagine. I think we'll be okay. We've got that kind of degree of flexibility in the back row as well. So we've got obviously Jamie Ritchie's in there. He, he can act as a line out option as well. So th- there's options there. And I, I think, yeah, the, the team's been picked with, let's, <laughs> it does see, it feels a bit like, let's not worry too much about line outs and scrums and that. Let's just yeah. run really, really fast and hard at people. Uh, and I like that tactic. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think it's it's an exciting lineup, and I think that it's a it's a yeah you can see it's a lineup that's that's a, a, a kind of lineup that's that's there to play rugby, yeah, as opposed to grind things out. So it's going to be a really interesting game. I think staying on the bench, um, John. I think we said on the podcast that that's a fairly obvious choice when you've got this yep. split because he can cover centre as well. Yeah, so we, were, I don't we think were talking about it. King Horn, yeah. I, I think King Horn was never going to make it. I don't think if. If we're going with this split, no, no, and that's not because we're King Horn truthers. It's not because it's not because we're haters. It's because he's been picked. Kyle Stain's been picked because he covers thirteen. Russell covers twelve. Harris covers twelve. Stain c- c- cover the wing as well. Hastings ten in full back. There's there's your back backs all covered. That's why he's there. King Horn can cover wing fifteen ten. You know, I bet yeah. you could run him in the centre, and that would be quite fun. But <laughs> I, d- I don't know how good it would be. <laughs> it's a hell of a turnaround for Finn Russell now, you know, because we've got two vice captains and a captain again. This will be—I mean, this will be interesting for Roman Pat whether he makes 
Stuart, whether he's happy to speak to vice captains or he's going to make Stuart Hogg run the length <laughs> of the pitch <laughs> every time he needs to talk yeah. to the captain. H- Hoggy covers yeah. 27 kilometres yeah. in the first half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it is a hell of a turn off in Russell because I think it was, you know, um, it was Ian had put on his Facebook memories about the fact that, you know, it was only two years ago, in fact, almost to the day that Finn Russell was kicked out of camp for, you know, drinking one too many beers, allegedly. And now here he is. But I think that says something about Gregor Townsend, John, that he's he's not a stubborn coach. Like other, I, I don't think, I, don't, I can't think of another international coach that would be open to burying the hatchet and moving on. Yeah. Well, that would be it for any any other player with that kind of breach. And given what happened in the press afterwards, that would that should have been it. Well, well, that that was the point I was going to make actually, Cam. The the press afterwards it did it got ugly. Like both sides were taking swipes at each other. It was ugly, and you know there probably was a question whether he could return. But it it does it says a lot, and I think we've seen a lot from Townsend over the years that he does have. You know, he had the, the incident with Stuart Hogg at Glasgow as well, where Stuart had his, uh, uh, so uh, people over in Ulster were batting their eyelids at him and saying, come hither, young Stuart. <laughs> um, and Gregor, yeah, Gregor dropped him, dropped him and said, no, do you know what? No, son, you can sit out the final, you can sit out this. And he, but they buried the hatchet and they got, they got the job done. And, you know, he's obviously his captain for Scotland now. So clearly, you know, as you say, Townsend, he must. He must forgive. This is this is revolutionary. Like, I wonder if it. I wonder if it's something Pep Guardiola does because obviously Townsend's talked a lot about following the the Pep philosophy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, he does the well. Pep Pep's great philosophy is F FIFO. FIFO, where you fit in or you f off. F- the, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, <laughs> that's that's Pep's philosophy. And I think I, I guess that to a certain extent, the well, Hogg certainly showed a lot of contrition when he came back into the Glasgow yeah. side. And I think Russell, I think him and Russell have come to an understanding. I don't think there's been any contrition necessarily on either side, but I think they maybe understand each other better and are, are willing, we're willing to move on. Um, speaking of moving on, though, Mitch, we've got Dave Rennie coming back, and now Dave Rennie left. I would say left Scotland under a bit of a cloud because this on paper I think he did very well at Glasgow. He, you know, he reached the pro what was it fourteen at the time, John? Fourteen final. at the time, yeah, yeah. He reached the final, he made the playoffs. Um but there was a lot after he left, there was a lot of disquiet from a number of ex players. On the flip side is that there's a number of ex players that really, really like Dave Rennie and really like what he did. But Glasgow never really kind of I don't know it's a feeling that they never kicked on under him. He didn't do much to develop Kind of players, but I don't know. The, the I don't know whether it's just the international rugby suits him better, but there seems to be a lot of kind of positive noise coming out of the Australian squad about what he's done after a bit of a shaky start. Yeah, the, the big thing seems to be around culture, and everyone's really positive about how he's just unified everyone. And I mean, Australia is naturally a bit of a cultural melting pot. Like we've got a lot of Pacific Islanders in the team um, naturally, and then also trying to get the Indigenous Australians represented in there as well. I think having his own Cook Island heritage, he's you know tried to embrace everyone in there. Everyone seems to have bought into it, which is good. Um, but you're right about the Glasgow because I, I was trying to keep up with um, some of the games, especially when I heard he was coming to the Wallabies. And you know, with the squad that he had and with some of the players there, I thought he started pretty strong and then probably didn't get to the peaks he had with the Chiefs in New Zealand. And part of me does wonder if he does need some of that sort of Polynesian or that you know um, that the Southern Hemisphere sort of vibe where there's just a difference in the players and how they sort of have grown up playing. I, I think a lot of the similarities you'd find in um, Waikato with the Chiefs, you'd probably find a lot in definitely parts of Queensland and New South Wales. So whether it's just the playing style, I, I think I, I've loved him for the Wallabies. He's, he seems to have uh, got everyone to buy in and that, that's a great thing. But you're right, I, I was a little shocked that he didn't get Glasgow to actually win the title, you know, to get them to that sort of next step consistently, I think. And how are you finding Matt Taylor? Because again, he kind of he felt like he ran out of steam a little bit with the street, with uh, Scotland. That you know, he'd started off the defence was quite solid, but over time our defence just seemed to get weaker and weaker. And you know, Steve Tandy's coming in and really tighten things up. So, has has he found a kind of a new lease of life in Australia with the, the Australian defence, or is it still a, an issue? I think he's it's ebbed and flowed. And the problem is, I think we've played New Zealand seven times 
um, <laughs> you know, in in Rennie's 17 game tenure. So, you know, that, that makes up such a large chunk. Uh, that first game when it was 16 all, I thought, oh my God, we're going to be able to do it. This is great. Um, you know, we, we can match it with them. And then this year we've seen so many blowouts and they, they do tend to do that. The uh, counter-attacking game's just so good. And what I'll say for Matt Taylor, he's done a great job of getting players to nail their one-on-one um, tackling and their cover defense. So that's been a really strong point. I think we've seen a lot of times where um, certain breaks have been made in, in previous years that just would have been a try. We've actually counted back pretty well. Um, given away a few more penalties in the process, but I think it's actually led to a lot less tries conceded. The, the challenge will be, I think, traditionally the Wallabies have been pretty easy to read and analyse, especially under the Checker era. It was very, I think, easy for teams to look at us and say, okay, well, this is how we can pick them apart. My concern is that obviously happened with Matt Taylor in Scotland, and I'm concerned that's going to start happening quite soon. Um, the majority of our wins have been done sort of in a similar way. We don't blow teams away by much. We sort of have to stay in it. It's a bit of a fight. Um, very clearly against Japan, we had this really weird tactic of not ever going for long passes, just trying to play blindside and really short passes. Good teams will pick us off if we try and do that again. And I don't think, you know, we were in a position to try and hide our best hand. So I think, yeah, my big concern is with that defensive um, side of things, our attacks improved a lot. Our one-on-one defense has improved a lot. I don't know how well we'll do against these uh, Northern Hemisphere teams. And th- this Scottish team will know a lot of how we're going to play. Yeah, and I suppose that's it, John, because I suppose the worry for Scotland is you've got a coaching setup in Australia that knows a lot about how the probably all the players operate, given they're familiar with the Scotland setup in yeah. Glasgow. Um, and But that works two ways. And I suppose the unknown quantity is that we've pro- we, we coaching-wise, we've got more unknowns to Australia than... than than the other way around that, that you know i don't yeah. think any of them anybody who's there worked with steve tandy for example no I, I, every- absolutely absolutely i think the i think the way it was interesting the, the matt taylor uh, thing when tandy came in the the difference in the, the scottish defense there's like the structure just seemed to change overnight and it was like really heartening but yeah i i, I totally agree i think we're, we're probably in a slightly better position, and Rennie's Rennie's been away from Scotland for a couple of years now. A couple of years, that would be about a couple yep. of years now. Jeez, time flies, doesn't it? Eh? <laughs> Just realising yeah, two years later, um, and in that time, you know, we've had yeah the the core of the side, the core of the Scottish side is probably similar, and that you know your your kind of headline players are still the same, but there's there's new there's new blood there, and Dave Rennie certainly will do his best to kind of create a structure that mitigates that my concern would be scrummaging wise um it's going to be a, a right ding dong Z- Xander Fagerson came on leaps and bounds under uh, the tutelage of uh, Petrus Duplessis so it'll be interesting to see if uh, Petrus is passing on some of the some of the wisdom to the Australian props on how to best uh, big Zandbags. yeah well, I know that Xander Fagerson took a lot of Petrus's things to the Lions thing because he had all those weird Oh, the bangs and, looks, and the, the stretching neck yeah, things. Yeah, that makes it look like you should find it in somebody's basement somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> or, in, or in a club where you have to yeah. do a secret <laughs> knock to go into. But yeah, <laughs> he certainly bought into that. Like you said, that, that'll that be interesting to see how weaknesses are exploited. Uh, Mitch, what's your feeling then? I mean, I know it's hard with we've not got the... You know, we've not got the, the Wallaby squad to look at, but Ken, how do, how do you see things panning out? What What's your prediction for scoreline? <laughs> School at the moment, I think it's going to be five points either side. I know, uh, other than the blowout at the end of 2017, I think the last six or seven games have been really, really tight, you know, within that sort of uh, one try scored. I think the concern for me is that the Wallabies will be playing their first game without either Quaid or Simon Karevi. So they're both definitely gone, which does make a big difference. O'Connor was in great form for Super Rugby, but he's had so many injuries. Um, and the concern for me is probably just two areas. The the back row, I'm not a massive Rob Liotta fan. So if he starts at six, I don't think he's anywhere near the caliber of Jamie Ritchie. Uh, Lockie Swinton's marginally better. But again, I think it's a real prime opportunity, especially for, you know, two young number eights, Matt Ferguson versus Rob Valentini is nearly worth price of admission. You know, they're like, that's a great clash. So I, I think for me, if we can shore up set piece, I do think we've probably got the better front row and locks depending on who we play. Um, that, that's probably the one area I'm a little bit more confident. 
But the Scottish outside backs, that's, that's lethal. And without Simon Karevi, we're looking at a centre combination probably of Plasami and Ikatao, both 23, both under or about 10 caps. Um, you know, against Johnson and Chris Harris, that's a massive ask. So I think if the Wallabies get uh, line out, scrum ascendancy, we probably get up by five. If Scotland get even parity, they get up. So that would be my um, my issue. I'm, I'll say Wallabies by four because I'm going to be optimistic. But um, <laughs> let's just say that the sports better camp would definitely be going Scotland. So I'm happy either way. Yeah. John, what's your feeling about the weekend? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a sensible analysis. Uh, I, I, I personally think set piece is not going to be. I don't think it's going to be a, an issue. Actually, I think, um, I think both teams are out to play, and both teams will will run the ball at each other uh, with every opportunity. I think if that happens, Scott, Scotland's kicking game, particularly with the fifty twenty two um, variation, I think both Hogg and Russell have shown an aptitude to, to that that law. So there could be some interesting uh, kicking battles, but I, I think, you know, I think the Scottish back row is too good with, with Richie. Richie being the kind of kingmaker there, I think he changes changes the whole dynamic of the Scottish back row. Because, um, I mean, he was originally a seven. He, he played seven and he's kind of come to six. So you've almost got that two-fetcher approach, which... We uh, stole from you guys all, all those years ago. Um, oh, the pooper which, model lives on. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, well, we went a step further and went with three sevens at one yeah. point. So. <laughs> that was in that 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 game. That game, yeah. That game, oh, that semi final. Yeah, shall not be quarter final. Should have yeah. been a semi final. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think I think the Scottish back row will get Scotland some front football. I think Russell could tear up any team on the planet just now. And as you say, that back three is absolutely lethal. Um, and the good thing from a Scottish perspective is the bench it doesn't drop the intensity at all. George Horn yeah. and Adam Hastings are not going to play any slower, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think Scotland could, if they get out in front, I think Scotland could actually cause a pretty big dent in Australia and it could be it could be 10 points I think the exciting thing is the possibility of cat at a rave John we've talked about this before we oh, yeah. on air, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, that's, all, that's shifts, all we care about that's, that's all, all we, we want about. out the game is Horn at 9 Hastings at 10 Russell at 12 that's that's, that's all, all that's, that's that's all we want all that's we need we want. To. yeah um I think I I don't know. I watched. I felt fairly confident, and then I watched Squidge's video uh, looking at how Australia have gone five in a row, and then I felt less confident watching kind of the way Australia yeah. had had gone. Because I think the last Australia game I watched was uh, the All Blacks game um, at the what, was it where is it was it in Perth where they played they played on the um, Aussie Rules oh, the yeah. pitch. Yeah. yeah, and I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm happy for you know, I'm, I'm happy the way things are going for the autumn. And then I watched Squidge's video of what's happened since then, because I had an, an awful lot of chance to to watch Australia. And yeah, it's it, I kind of feel it's a shame that Australia aren't able to bring the full strength side up because I would have rather yeah. have seen us. I kind of feel that that's always going to be an asterisk against this Australia team that comes up, and that feels. I would much rather that Scotland were testing themselves against full, you know. Yeah. Test squads at full strength. So that's that's the. I think I can see Scotland by ten, but I think I would much rather that we had, you had Karevi and you had Cooper and you had all these players available to you because yeah. that would have been a hell of a test. Not that I don't think we'll have a good one, or that Australia are more than capable of. You know, if these yeah. young guys seem hungry and the culture's there. Then they're more than capable of giving us a shock. Because we're more than capable of shooting ourselves in the foot. <laughs> oh yes, we we are well, world beaters at that. I think one of the things that will be a big factor is just how good these um, French-based players are. Because I think you know we've seen with our team we're in pretty desperate need of a bit of more experience at hooker and lock. And so if Tolu Lart is in the form he was for the 2019 World Cup, then that's great. You know, like he's an instant starter, then he'll probably do all right. If Skelton and Armour are as good as everyone's saying they're playing in France and they can replicate that at Test level, that's great. But for me, and my question for you guys, I guess, is our fullback stock's just completely shot. We have not developed in enough fullbacks. And so, obviously, they've tried to jettison Kirtley Beal in there. Does it really matter who we pick at fullback? Are you guys feeling pretty confident your aerial game is just going to be quite dominant against us? Yeah, because I think du- Duhan came on leaps and bounds for the lot, particularly yeah. Scotland and with the Lions. I think what Duhan has shown, and we've had a lot of debate about kind of 
you know, Scottish and resi- how he used residency. But I mean, effectively, he's, the Scotland developed Duhan into the player that he is. When he came over, he was, you know, he had the muscle, but he didn't have all the technical ability. But yeah. you look at him, him under the high ball for the Lions. He was really strong. I think the difficulty was that they there was, you know, we, again we talked about it during the Lions series, there were guys getting in the way, and it wasn't the execution wasn't there. But his ability under high balls fine. Hogg's ability. They don't tend to drop Darcy Graham back. It tends to be Russell that's the, yeah. back in the backfield and, and Matt Ferguson. Darcy tends to kind of come up into the line a bit more in defence because even though he's five foot nothing, he, he can absolutely smash it at a ruck. Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't know what you, how you feel, John, but I mean, the high ball's not a particularly concern for me for Scotland anymore. It was maybe two years ago, but... Yeah, I mean, I think defensively, so uh, the high ball is always a concern uh, for Scotland defensively, but I think if, you know, I think if Scotland can can just get, again, get parity on that, like not make yeah. too many mistakes, not not drop too many balls. Um, thinking about the way Rennie set his Glasgow teams up as well, it, you know, the, the, the kicks, the kicking game was different. There wasn't as many kicks to compete um, it was more kicks for space, so that would play into yeah. Scotland's hands as well. Uh, you know, obviously, just kind of removing the the watery that is the high ball sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think offensively, I think Scotland would be confident, um, no matter who you put at fullback, and especially if you put Beale at fullback. Yeah, because yeah. th- that's one of the big things. Your kicking games going leaps and bounds. I'm glad that you mentioned it before, John, because I I know when Nick White first came back. I think he just saw Conor Murray do a few boxes. He's like, I guess I better do that. But there, was no, there was no rhyme or reason. It was just, all right, well, let's just chuck it up there and oh, see how it goes. So, Conor Murray. Oh. Yeah. And we, we, we look at, the, you know, you look at what Ali Price is absolutely lethal at box kicks. Yeah. You know, yeah. he, he can, you know, drop them on a penny and make them into really contestable. And I think we'll see that. We didn't see a lot against Tonga because I don't think we needed to. But no. that, I, and again, I think the part of, part of that was keeping the powder dry for the Australia games. We wouldn't give too much yeah. away. So I think we see a lot of box kicking from Ali Price for for Duhan to kind of run onto and chase. Yeah, yeah. Cer- certainly if there's nothing on that, that will be the go-to. Though Price will put the ball in the air and um, watch Duhan or 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 someone else. Jimmy Ritchie's obviously good at the chase as well. So get Big Ritchie under it, and if you can't get it back, smash the boy in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, that I think that's that. We'll, we'll leave it there for this for the, for this preview. Uh, Mitch, thank you very much for joining us. Cheers, so man. late and staying up late. Yeah. Let you get to bed <laughs> no. now. <laughs> <laughs> no. Look, thanks very much for having me. And, and sorry that the Wallabies team wasn't out to talk about. But I, look, the, the Scottish team is so exciting. I can't wait for this match. Yeah. No, I think it's absolutely superb. John, thanks again. We'll, You're welcome. We'll see Cam. you Wednesday. Back, Probably we'll be back Wednesday with the we'll back back Wednesday with the normal full podcast, and then we'll have a, a South Africa preview later in the week. Uh, but for the moment, it's goodbye from me and goodbye from John and Mitch. Cheers, folks. <laughs>